Here we are. I'm so happy to have you here with us, Dr. Nancy G. So we have a, a very fun, informal conversation for um, those of you joining us today. I'm going to just talk for a moment and let those who can join us live log in. I do know many people watch this recording after. So if you're joining us later, hello. Um, but this is going to be a wonderful opportunity to meet one of my favorite people to talk to and someone who really drives our efforts, not only at Pet Partners and IIIP, but um, in the field as a whole. So as you're logging in, please go ahead and put in the chat, just say your name, um, maybe where you're joining us from, the species that you either work with as a therapy animal team now or hope to work with or species you've worked with in the past. We just want to know who is here with us. And it also helps me to know um, that we are officially live. I see some hellos coming in. Hi from Bree and from Kimberly. Um, and we have some dog people. I know Bree's a rabbit person. So all different kinds of species joining us today. As we talk um, throughout this conversation and you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, this will be a time just to get to know Dr. G. So I could go on and tell you all of my favorite things about Dr. G, but instead I'm gonna stop and let you introduce yourself and talk about your professional background and our viewers will quickly understand why we're so excited to have you with us. Great. Well, I'm I'm thrilled to be here, and I hope people will ask a lot of questions. This is going to be a lot of fun, just having a, a really informal conversation. So, um, I'm Nancy G. Uh, my PhD is in cognitive and neurosciences, and it's kind of a long story. But um, I was very much into dog training and showing dogs, and I ended up uh, seeing if my dogs would would pass a therapy dog test, and they did. And then that that just led my career down a completely different path. So I was studying human cognitions like memory and, and executive functioning and that sort of thing. And then I started taking my dogs to, to visit uh, preschool children. And I just saw some amazing effects with, with these kids. And, you know, the, the scientist in me, you know, my PhD is in psychology. So the scientist in me is saying, is there anything real here? This is great anecdotally, but you know, can I test this and will it sort of survive experimentation? And it did. And I started publishing papers on, you know, these, these uh, therapy dog visitations. And I saw effects on cognition like memory and problem solving and, and uh, categorization. And so just really neat kinds of effects on preschool kids, their ability to adhere to instructions in the presence of a dog. And, you know, I, it, it just, it, it very much intrigued me. And so I was publishing and, uh, and, and getting sort of some notice in the field. And then I got hired by uh, Waltham, which is uh, at the time it was called the uh, Waltham Pet Care Center, but it's now the uh, Waltham uh, Pet Care Science Institute. And it's over in England. So I moved over to England for a couple of years and I served as their research manager running their, this entire international portfolio of research on human animal interaction. I got to meet people from all over the world. I got to work with people from all over the world. I made so many amazing connections. I loved living in England. I loved working there. Uh, but personally, I needed to be back in the United States. I moved back to the United States, but I kept working with with Waltham after I came back to my academic position and I worked as their research manager for another three years, you know, continuing the same work, which was a, just a ton of fun, incredible experience. And then Sandy Barker, another uh, HAI sort of uh, expert and amazing human being recruited me for the position I'm in now. And I kept saying, no, Sandy, I've moved enough. I don't want another job. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay right where I am. And she said, no, 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 you're perfect for this. You're perfect. You gotta come. You gotta come see. You gotta come see. So now I'm at Virginia Commonwealth University in Richmond, and I'm the director of the Center for Human Animal Interaction, and I hold an endowed chair position. It's the Bill Balaban Chair in Human Animal Interaction, and I am in this amazing situation where I have I run a dogs on call program where we've got 60 plus human handlers, and some of them have multiple dogs in the program and dogs on call visits throughout the health system. Uh, they visit the university. Uh, it's an incredibly active uh, animal assisted, sort of we do animal assisted interventions. We're currently running three randomized clinical trials in the hospital. One is with older adults. 
One is with those with mental illness and one is with children in pediatrics. And we're looking at the impact of these therapy dog visits to people who are hospitalized and really kind of, you know, sort of at their at their worst. They're struggling with very serious health conditions because the people in our study are, are hospitalized for five days or more. And I'm sorry, Taylor, I realize I'm going on and on. But I'm in this amazing situation where I get to do this incredible research funded by Waltham, by Habri, and by Purina. And I'm super excited to have those kinds of funders backing the work that we're doing. And then I also have this amazing Dogs on Call program. And I also uh, lecture. I work with medical students and residents. And I consider myself incredibly lucky to be able to do what I get to do. And I get to work with pet partners. I'm on their board. And I'll stop now and I'll let Taylor ask a question. <laughs> no, you get, we love all of your experience. And I love your mission to, um, you know, bring the science to the anecdotal stories that we all hear and know with therapy animals. Um, and so you mentioned you've been a longtime friend of Pet Partners, which is the sister organization to AAAIP. I'm the chair of our Human Animal Bond Advisory Board. And you played such a big role in helping us to launch AAAIP and to know what services are needed for professionals to just help move the needle in the space um, and bring, you know, the science to what we're doing, bring um, standards. So uh, we so appreciate you being here. I see we have many members of AAAIP um, joining us, many professionals um, joining us with different animals that they partner with. So again, all throughout this conversation, questions about practice, questions for Dr. G, now is your time to put them in. I'll be monitoring them. My next question, though, is a very easy one, but a fun one. Um, tell us about the animals that you share your life with right now? Oh, of course. I have three dogs. Um, they are all uh, black miniature poodles. <laughs> and uh, Fletcher is the oldest. He's 13. And um, I have Allie, who you see in this picture, actually. She is three and she is a member of Dogs on Call. So that's us actually doing an event for Dogs on Call. And I have a puppy who's 11 months old. His name is Luke and he's in training. He may or may not ever decide he wants to be a therapy dog, but he's the one who's gonna to get to make that choice right now. He's enjoying learning about rally. We do rally obedience and Allie does rally <laughs> and she has, um, she's working on her advanced title. So she got uh, her novice and her intermediate titles and now she's one leg away from advanced. And Luke has been in one trial and he has uh, one rally novice leg. And we have another trial coming up in February. So we'll see how he does oh, there. Yeah. And then you could probably see behind me, I also have an aquarium with fish and shrimp. <laughs> so those are my pets. That's amazing. You're a fellow poodle person, though my poodles are um, not <laughs> any kind of uh, champions of agility or rally. Um, but it's very common. A lot of people in the, in the therapy animal world um, do train their animals and, and do um, enjoy these other activities in the training world. If, if you do have a, um, a background of training similar to Dr. Peace, put it in the chat. Let us know. We like to see what you do to work with your animals outside of session. So important that they have that um, decompression period. We had mine are a bunch of couch potatoes um, who lay around. But um, so you you get to witness so many different therapy animal visits, interactions of your own. I when we were prepping for this, I said I was going to ask this question, and you said you would have a hard time narrowing it down. So feel free to tell us um, however much you'd like, but. We want to hear an example or two of some really impactful therapy animal interactions that you've witnessed over your impressive career. You know, this is a really hard question because I have seen so many, uh, so many really uh, astounding events happen that seem fictional, you know, when you talk about them. But I think for me, it kind of goes back to my very first therapy dog. His, his name was Louie, and he's the one who, who got me down this track. He was an amazing therapy dog, very intuitive. He, he loved people. He loved to be held and cuddled. And um, I, I started out visiting a preschool classroom, and it was an integrated classroom where there were special needs children and uh, quote unquote typical children in the, in the classroom. And there was, there was one little guy in the classroom who wasn't all that excited about dogs. In fact, he was a little bit fearful, but he was nonverbal. And so he, he, he had lots of reactions to the dog that, that indicated he didn't want to be near the dog. So we never, we never forced the issue. He didn't have to be near the dog. He sat with, you know, one of the teacher's aides. He could watch what was happening. And, and usually the kids would sit in a circle 
And so we would just, you know, Louis would walk into the middle of the circle. He'd go around to visit kids. And, you know, we just wouldn't, would never force a situation. One day, um, Louis was walking out of the circle and this, this little guy stuck his hand out and just ran it down Louis's back as he walked out. And I thought, oh, how sweet is that? Um, and then it, it quickly magnified after that. Um, this, this little boy was incredibly interested in following Louis, but he didn't, the little boy didn't want to do his physical therapy. So one of his physical therapy activities was going up and down the stairs. And so what we would do is Louis would go up the stairs and wait on the landing and the little guy would come up the stairs and then he'd get to pet Louie. And then we'd go up the next landing and we would do three stories up and three stories down. So that's six landings altogether uh, on the way up and then on the way down as well. And it, it was just amazing to see this transformation of a child who really didn't, who was very resistant, didn't want to be around the dog to a child who was completely enthralled with the dog. And this dog became the motivation for this little boy to do his therapy. And to me, that, that really signals something impressive about the, the dog itself. And then one other, one other one that also happened with Louis, um, we went to visit a different special needs classroom and there was a little girl in there who was blind and um, she had never actually interacted with a dog before. And hmm. she said she wanted to, to touch Louis. And so I said, okay. So I put, I put Louie in front of her facing away from her and we showed her that she could reach out and touch his back and, and feel him. And this most amazing thing happened where not too, too fast, but they quickly, Louie got into her lap and she just, she just wrapped her arms around him and was just holding him. She started crying. Everyone in the room started crying it was just this incredibly special moment. It's hard to verbalize actually the way it happened, but just watching yeah. this bond develop so quickly and so naturally for a child who had never in her life experienced a dog before. That just, that blew me away. And you should have seen all the teachers. Everybody was just completely blown away at how innocent this moment was mm -hmm. and how incredibly powerful it was at the same time. Anyway, anyway those, are, those are two of the ones that I think really stand out for me for, for obvious reasons. I can imagine. I almost started crying just hearing about that because it, it is that instantaneous connection um, that happens. And, you know, something that I always say we don't have to have the words for. Uh, and I love your first example, too, because it's not always the people who immediately identify as the animal lovers who really um, benefit most. And of course, we always have, you know, the opportunity for both the animal and the participant to provide, you know, consent. But over time, I, I'll remember my work in the Department of Juvenile Justice. Um, I had some boys who would see my poodle and perhaps think my poodle was not the coolest breed in the world. And, uh, you know, maybe act a bit interested for various reasons but then over time you know they would be on the floor baby talking with ivy and you know just kind of melting back down into the teenager child that they were in that safe place it's just so amazing i see some um comments coming in about you know people who can resonate with those stories so um i you know we talked about the anecdotal piece and you opened us up saying it's so important to back that with research. And so you're very involved in the, the world of research. What are some of your favorite um, findings or suggestions, you know, for future studies that you're noting, given your involvement in that empirical world? Yeah, you know, I think it's, it's hard not to kind of go back to the original um, uh, Erica Friedman study and, you know, survival uh, following a heart attack. Just that finding that that pet owners were more likely to be alive one year later after having had a heart attack than, than non-pet owners. You know, I think that really spurred my interest in the field. And then, you know, seeing the results in, in terms of uh, decreases in, in blood pressure and increases in oxytocin, kind of that bonding sort of feel good hormone um, and, and decreases uh, in cortisol with regard to interacting with animals. We see that these interaction studies we can we see findings like decreases in depression. Pet ownership is a little bit harder to tease out, right? Because people pick their own pets. And in science, you want to randomly assign a pet to a condition, right? So a person, you know, has to say, okay, you can decide whether I have a dog, a cat, a horse, a turtle, or whatever. And people don't tend to want to do that. So there are very few studies where people are randomly assigned to receive a pet 
and then become a pet owner for that animal. So pet owner, owner studies are a little bit harder to do. But one of the things that I'm actually working on now with Erica Friedman, so she gets me, you know, really interested in the, in the work. And now I'm doing research with her. It's kind of a dream come true for me. One of the studies that, that we're working on is we're looking at pet ownership for older adults in the Baltimore Longitudinal Study of Aging, so the BLSA. And we're finding some amazing stuff. Pet owners have um, less loss in mobility over time. They have less loss in cognition over time. So owning a pet helps you hang on to your mobility and helps you hang on to your cognition. That's amazing to me. And I think we need more pet ownership studies, but they need to be done in this longitudinal way, which we're very lucky to have our partners at the, the National Institute on Aging and National Institutes of Health, the NIA portion, and the BLSA folks. They were amazing in terms of getting these questions built into this study and allowing us to look at this over time. So we got pet ownership history going back 10 years, and now we're getting pet, owner, pet ownership currently, and we'll continue to collect it. We have some incredible data. We just published a paper on physical activity. The cognition paper just went in. Hopefully that will be out soon. But just, you know, some amazing work that got me interested and so I reached out to Erica at a conference and before you know it, I'm doing research with her. And this it's, you know, I've, I consider myself very lucky to have met the people that I've met in this field who are really passionate about this work, who are doing this, doing this work and doing high quality research. And I mean, it's anyway, I, so I hope that answers your question. <laughs> It does, and I can relate because I feel the same way. I, when I first started, uh, you know, with our sister organization, Pet Partners, a, a few years ago, and I was talking to our CEO, and I said, "Hold on, I get to talk to people like Dr. Nancy G and Dr. Aubrey Fine as a part of my job. You're going to pay me to do that." So I, I can definitely relate to that um, kind of full circle moment of being able to work with people um, who've really brought, you know, direction to the field. I do see one question come that came in that I want to um, ask from Ellie. So um, let's see, Ellie's been training with a nine month old puppy since August with a desire to be a therapy dog on the college campus, which she works at. Um, part of her role is case management based for students and the other part is to provide crisis response within the police department for students in mental distress. Very important job. Um, so the puppy will not be able to train in any of the buildings on campus until he's completed the pet partner certification. So we're wondering what tips do you have for helping him integrate into the environment when all of this training and exposure has to be in that different, you know, setting than his day-to-day -day job? You know, it's a, it's a great question and something that we face with our Dogs on Call program because um, people don't train in a hospital. They have to go get their training, their pet partner's registration, and then they come to us and now we say, okay, let's see how you do in a hospital. And that's a huge leap. And so what we have set up is that we have a building that is a hospital-like building but actually there aren't patients in the building. And so we first have our teams come in and we shadow them as they do visitation in that building. So they meet people, they ride on elevators, they get to, they get to practice in a similar but not same building. And then we take them into the hospital. We encourage our dogs on call teams to come back and practice. That's it's called, we call it West Hospital, that's the name of the building. There aren't, you know, inpatients in there. There may be outpatients, but it's um, but it's typically offices and that sort of thing now, but it still has the same kind of floors. It still has the, the elevators that, you know, make elevator noises mm -hmm. and dogs are used to riding in elevators typically. So another thing that we encourage our teams to do is go to places that are dog friendly, that have elevators, like for instance, Bass Pro. Bass Pro here in Richmond has an elevator that dogs can ride in. And so you can go and take your dog, get, you know, bring some treats and train your dog to help them understand that elevator can be a safe and fun place. Hey, look, you get your toy in here. We're going to play a game. You know, this is, yeah. this is a fun thing to do. And so th the other part of it is once you sort of get through that pet partner's registration is don't push it with the amount of time the dog spends in the location go there for five minutes. You know, I realize that can be a hassle and parking and all that. I, I believe me, I understand that, you know, downtown and parking is not easy, but the point is keep it from your dog's perspective. And so get your dog in there, 
get them a, a couple of minutes in the inside the building, take them outside, you know, take them for a walk, completely de-stress, maybe go back in for another couple minutes. Don't overdo it. Absolutely leave before the dog wants to leave, but make it incredibly rewarding and fun while they're in there. And then, you know, it's a pet partner's motto, right? You are your animal's best advocate. Follow the motto. Advocate for your dog. Watch for signs of stress in your dog and intervene before you see them. So if your dog is starting to look like they're stressed at all, do something fun. Walk away from the situation. Get outside the building. Help your dog to relax. And most importantly, learn to read your dog's body language. Understand their signs. And when your dog is starting to look at you like, I'm tired, I'm not really enjoying this, you know, respect their wishes and get them outside. You know, have a toy or a ball or something that you get them out there. They get to play. They get a chance to de-stress. They get a chance to kind of shake it off and, and relax. And then go home and maybe try it again another day. But I think those short sessions, I just can't sell those enough. Those are so important. Very short sessions that are lots of fun, really upbeat, you know, and then over time, build up the length of those sessions while watching your dog very carefully and then don't exceed your two hour limit, you know, that, that sort of thing. But that's what, that's what I would suggest in terms of helping them to integrate into those facilities. Because in so many cases, a hospital in particular, we cannot bring dogs into the hospital that don't already have a pet partner's registration or appropriate therapy animal registration. We, we simply can't do it. So it's not an option. So we try to do it in stages and we try to make it kind of a, a slow, but fun and upbeat yeah. process for the dog. Yeah, that makes total sense. And um, it reminds me too, to make sure to plug for our audience. If this is a topic you wanna to take a deep dive in, we have a couple of courses at AAAIP that might be of interest to you that uh, Dr. Nancy G helps serve as a subject matter expert for. Um, we have a course on animal welfare and well-being, and a course on animal training and communication that talks about all of these best practices and getting an animal um, ready. I see there was a comment too that came in about um, links to this research. So we will make sure to put my email address in these comments so that you can message me and I will be happy to get you um, links to this research. Um, next month, we're very excited because we are going to have an event to close the IIIP members where we're going to take a bit more of a deeper dive into your um, professional expertise and to talk about a tool that's really being mentioned at almost every um, talk I go to these days, the lead risk assessment tool. So if you're a IIIP member, we're going to really dive into this at our next closed session, which you um, know about and you're welcome to join AAAIP and join that session. But can you take just a couple of moments to talk to us about what that tool is? Yeah, absolutely. So it, it was developed out of need for a research study. So this is a collaboration I was working on with Professor Kirsten Mites and her team at the University of Lincoln in the UK. And um, basically, we were setting up a randomized control trial that was going to go into various uh, school classrooms. Uh, with children who are around the age of eight. So again, typical and special needs. And the tool was designed to safeguard the participants. Uh, so in this case, it was students, but it the tool itself can be applied to other participants um, to safeguard the dogs and address any environmental concerns specific to that situation. So in a classroom, there may be Legos laying around on the floor or crayons or you know, that sort of thing that we really needed to watch out for that the dogs didn't consume or that could, that could become a hazard in another way. Um, the tool itself, it establishes who the responsible parties are, lists their contact information. We need to know how to get a hold of those folks. Um, and it gets those people in the loop from the start. It's so important to get administrators involved from the beginning. Get them on board so that they know what's happening, when it's happening, and that you are taking this, the necessary steps to safeguard the individuals involved and the animals involved. The tool itself identifies potential hazards, who could be harmed by those potential hazards, and it, it stipulates what precautions can be put into place um, to address any, any of those particular concerns. And it addresses everything from allergies, uh, potential zoonotic diseases, parasites, phobias, hygiene, um, and it puts a care plan in place for the dog, which is so important. And that care plan can be applied to other animals as well. I keep saying dog because my research is about dogs, but I love other, other animals too. So this tool can be applied to, you know, rabbits, cats, horses, 
whatever. The point is the tool itself is generalizable to a wide variety of circumstances. But what we're doing is we're assessing risk and we're taking steps to mitigate that risk. And then we have a plan in place for what if something does happen? What do you do and what those steps are specifically? That's such an important tool. So like I said, we'll be um, having Dr. G with us for a full presentation on that and another closed session um, via Zoom for our members. We'll put that information in the chat. We hope that you'll join us and bring your questions. Um, and it's just a really a, a great practical tool to move the field forward. Um, a question from Heather, and I'm going to, I have one last question for Dr. G. So if anyone else has questions, go ahead and put them in the chat so I can make sure we ask them today. Um, but Heather wants to know if you have tips or resources for how to prepare handlers to respond in school settings in the wake of trauma, such as a student or teacher's death, um, recommendations on how to be present and how to interact. Um, and Heather mentioned, of course, you know, we refer participants to mental health professionals who are present, but just wanting to know, you know, what best practice you have in that setting. Yeah, the, um, I don't I, I don't have any uh, references that, that sort of spring to mind right away, but I can tell you that um, you might want to take a look at the Blue Dog um, dot org, I think. Uh, this is, again, Professor Kirsten Meitz. Um, it's a bite prevention program, but there are a ton of resources available for um, dogs and for children especially, and, and coping with loss, uh, I think, is one of the resources available there. Um, I, I can't think of any uh, with regards to trauma off the top of my head, um, but maybe if, uh, if you want, Taylor, I could shoot you some over an email and you can send them out. Um, <laughs> but yeah. At the end of the day, I think, you know, I dealt with this with the preschool kids uh, myself. My therapy dog, Louie, um, got very sick suddenly and passed away. And I, I talked to the teachers about how we deal with that with the kids because they were very much attached to him. And so uh, we did just that. We had a conversation with them. We were very open about it. We let the parents know exactly what was happening. Um, I had another therapy dog at the time, and I brought her with me as part of that conversation. Um, but the teachers also spent time talking with the children about it. And I think, you know, just the concept of being very open and honest about it with kids, I think that just matters so much. This is a loss. It is, it can be uh, very painful. It was horrible for me. I mean, I knew just how much I hurt. I had university students working with me and I had to break the news to them. And, and we were all in tears during that conversation. Um, but I think in many ways it brought us closer together. And I think it is also part of having animals in our lives. We know we are not going to outlive them. And, um, and so we have to, we have to learn to deal with that. And the, in many ways, there's a quote, and I don't remember exactly the words, but it's the, the deeper the hurt uh, signifies the deeper the love. And so it's painful and it's powerful. And I think that it, it can be it, it can be done appropriately and it can be done in a very healing way. And, and likewise, I am aware that there are some great resources out there about trauma. I'd re, I would refer you to Leslie, who's also on the, the HeyBab um, as a person to, to reach out to on that topic. She's got some amazing yeah. uh, stuff going on the topic of trauma. And so, um, Taylor, I don't know if you want to put some uh, information in the chat about that, but that that would be great. Absolutely. And I saw Lisa noted that the Pet Partners Animal Assisted Crisis Response course helped with that. Uh, Dr. Yep. Leslie Stewart, yep. who yep. Um, Dr. D just mentioned, assisted with that to talk about, you know, some of the hardest part in responding to trauma is not just being there for your animal, but as people. You know, what do we say um, during this very vulnerable time? So we have some resources there. Um, so I see just one last question from participants, um, and then I'll ask you my final question. So coming from a couple of different people, looking for suggestions questions on how um, professionals can get involved. What do you suggest in terms of getting involved in research and then just making connections to support the goal of moving the field forward? Absolutely. So first of all, I would suggest that you go to the ISAS conference. So International Society for Anthrozoology. I am the president-elect. So at our upcoming conference, I will uh, become president of that organization. Um, so that, uh, but I started out there. I started out attending ISAS, and, and Taylor, you mentioned Aubrey Fine. He's another one. I did a, a poster at an APA conference, American Psychological Association. And we happened, Aubrey and I happened to have posters side by side. Mm -hmm. and, I, and that's where I met him. 
going to conferences can be so important. I had an amazing conversation with him. And before you know it, at the next APA conference, Aubrey and I were co-presenting a <laughs> seminar on human-animal interaction. And uh, I remember I met Jim uh, Griffith there, who is from the, the NICHD. And uh, we had an, a wonderful conversation about the importance of really good, solid research in this area. So how to get involved in research, attend those conferences, meet people and talk to them. That's what I did with Erica Friedman. And I've established a long-term collaboration with her. Likewise, with Aubrey. Aubrey and I worked together on writing things. Uh, we wrote a book together. Um, and in fact, by the way, I should mention that I do have a book forthcoming um, and so this is being published by the American Psychiatric Association, and it's on how animal-assisted interventions or how animals in general can play a role in the treatment of mental illness. And there are a number of great chapters in there. It's an edited volume, so lots of interesting people read their work and then send them an email and talk to them. Ask them if you can jump on a Zoom. You want to get to know them better. You've got a research idea. Run your research ideas by them or ask them. You know, another great thing is that people love it when you contact them and say, hey, do you want me to collect data for you? I could do that in my professional setting because so many of us are interested in doing research in professional settings. We need lots of professional settings to reach out to. And if you're one of those people, I'm going to be on the phone. I'm going to call you and say, hey, will you collect data for me? And we'll get it through the Institutional Review Board. We'll do everything, you know, according to policy. But it would be wonderful for me to have those kinds of connections. So I encourage you. To, to just communicate with researchers. So often, I think we all feel a little bit siloed, mm -hmm. but we're really not. If you just reach out, you'll find that other people really want to connect with you too. And there are special interest groups. I was a co-convener of a special interest group at the Gerontological Society of America. So if you're interested in research on aging, that's a great group to get connected with. If you're interested in APA, there's an HAI section in, in, in American Psychological Association. You know, ISAS is all about uh, human-animal interaction research. So there are some really great organizations that you can get connected with other people. Serve on the board of ISAS. You know, it gives you a chance to really get to know other people. You talk about things that are relevant to the society, but before you know it, you've got a friend and colleague you're doing research with. And it's just, it's a great way to connect. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I love what you said to you about practitioners um, coming to researchers and, you know, you have access to data at AAAIP. We even have some checklist for you to see, are you ready, um, you know, to be working with a researcher? Is your project a good fit? So um, those kinds of collaborations are so important. And I have found, I mean, I might be a bit biased, but I think this is such a friendly field and people, um, every time I've ever reached out to anyone, I've gotten nothing but encouragement back um, and the desire, you know, we are all moved by the same mission across all of the organizations um, that are out there and all of the different interest groups. You know, we believe in the power of human animal interaction and we want to bring that to as many people as possible. So my last question for you, and we might have touched on it a bit, but I think it's worth kind of rephrasing and asking again. So if someone's joining us and they are wanting to incorporate the therapy animal into their professional work, what's your number one biggest piece of advice for them? Yeah. So for me, it's, it's to understand and, and protect the animal. It's, for me, it's all about the animal. We, we absolutely cannot treat them like tools and we cannot force the issue. We need to give these animals agency so that they are genuinely our partners. When you do that, I actually think some very profound and dare I say magical things happen. When the animal joins of their own volition and participates because it's something they want to do, that allows the animal to use these amazing senses that they have to connect with your clients or with the participants in the research study it, or, or with hospital patients. I think it changes the game. So understanding what your animal needs, understanding what they want, and the reality is not every animal wants to be a therapy animal. And I think we have to face that fact. So you may get a puppy and say, oh, I've got this amazing golden retriever. Of course, they're going to be a therapy animal. Well, maybe that golden retriever doesn't want to be a therapy animal. And that's okay. Yeah. We, we have to let the animal sort of do what they want to do and sort of choose this work. Not every human wants to run up to people and have them touching them all over the place either. And so I think we have to recognize that not every dog really wants to do that either. 
I think within reason, you can train a dog to enjoy it by giving them rewards for enjoying it. But at some point, I think we have to step out of that process and let the animal's intrinsic desire take over. And I've seen that happen so many times. And I'm going to go back to another anecdote that I didn't tell before. I shadowed one of our dogs on call teams to the infusion clinic in, in our Children's Hospital of Richmond. So this is where children are receiving treatment for cancers and other really horrible diseases. And it's a, a clinic where they're sitting in a chair and they're hooked up to an IV and usually one or both parents are there with them. And the, the child doesn't feel well. And it's just, it's, it's really a hard time for the family. You can, you can see it in the shoulders of the parents. They're just weighted down by what's happening. I saw one of our dogs on call dogs walk in there and you know, the, there was a child there who wasn't paying much attention. The dog just walked over and just a little nose touch. And the child put a hand on the dog's head. And then before you know it, the child sat up. And then the child smiled. And the child got up. And they're allowed to walk around with their little IV pole. Mm. Got up and got on the floor and, and actually played with the dog during this really tough time for them. And you, you should have seen the, the parents, you know, their faces just absolutely lit up. And then everyone in the room, all their healthcare workers, I didn't realize just the gravity of the situation for this child until I saw the looks on everyone's faces. There was not a dry eye in the room. This was just such a profound experience for this child to, to just be a kid for a moment, mm -hmm. just to have a moment of relief. And that to me, what we're doing it is so incredibly impactful. I love doing the science, but these anecdotes, these moments, that's hard to capture in the science, but those are real and those those are profound. You're trying to make me cry on Facebook Live today, Dr. G. <laughs> You're really close a couple of times, but it is so moving and we're just so thankful to have your leadership in this space. Um, like I said, you know, it's our goal to make this intervention more accessible, but at the same time, you know, protecting the integrity and the welfare um, and, you know, the efficacy so that uh, in, in years from now, we'll look back and uh, more and more people will know what therapy animals are and more and more people will have access. So we're so thankful. I see Kimberly put in a crying face. So you're, I'm not alone and feeling very emotional. Thank you so much for joining us today. We cannot wait to have you back for our members event next month. So that is in the um, comments. Bring your questions to learn about that lead risk assessment tool. And if you think about this event and more questions come up, um, Dr. G will be there for us. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Awesome. Everyone have a great afternoon. Bye. Bye.